We are falling on our face right now as a nation because we are jumping higher, trying something harder than any country's ever attempted in the history of the world. You're listening to Lives at Speak, a podcast highlighting the remarkable work of Sidwell Friends School alumni. I'm Brian Garman, the head of school at Sidwell Friends, a pre-K to 12th grade independent Quaker school located in Washington, D.C. In this interview, we sat down with Anand Giradardas, an alumnus from the class of 1999. A writer, author, and social commentator, Anand's writings can be seen on his website, The Inc., The New York Times, Time, and The New Yorker. He is a regular commentator on MSNBC and the author of three books, the most recent of which is Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World. In this episode, we discuss the critical role journalism plays in addressing injustice and delve into America's need for social and historical introspection. Anand, it's great to have you with us today. Sidwell Friends School alumnus, writer, and public intellectual. Uh, thanks so much for making time to be with us. I know there's a lot of demand for your expertise and insight in this election season. Well, I'm so happy to to be here. It's not every day I get to talk to one of the very small handful of people who helped make me a writer. Well, that's kind of you to say. I, I can remember you sitting uh, in the left-hand side of my classroom with another uh, great writer uh, named Tori, uh, who uh, has his own journalist career going right now. Do you stay in touch with Tori? I do. I do. In fact, uh, we even got to work on a little bit of a story together because I had this uh, incident where um, Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, America's banker, um, had led this initiative to you know have big corporations claim that they're now interested in social purpose. And I made some critical comments about it in the New York Times, and Jamie Dimon did not like that and called me. And we had this long conversation in which he said some really weird things. And it was not off the record. It was just the you know, conversation that I treated as on the record. And I, you know, I didn't write about it myself, but I told Tori the whole story, and Tori wrote about it in the Washington Post. So our high school career came back together 20 years later. That's fantastic. And you both were. Uh editors of the horizon yes uh I, and I, uh, I remember we, those days we had a controversial <laughs> we had a controversial <laughs> tenure i believe you were our advisor at some point in that it was um it was a really i mean it's interesting i think a lot of people who edit school newspapers in college or or in high school um you know it's like a it's like a good extracurricular to do and a lot of those folks don't end up necessarily having anything to do with journalism. But Tori and I, I mean, and I think we would have predicted that then and it's turned out to be true. Like we really wanted to be journalists and we saw, and, and we both are still journalists 20 years later. And we therefore saw the platform of the Horizon School newspaper as the beginning of our career. Like this was our Woodward and Bernstein opportunity, except unfortunately it was like a newspaper at a high school. And we acted accordingly, which got us into a tremendous amount of trouble. Uh, we had uh, issues with being censored by the school. We had uh, we printed a blank front page in protest in which we pretentiously quoted Camus uh, to try to justify our, our position on free speech. Um, we had an issue of the magazine confiscated, uh, sorry, a survey. We, we, we decided to do a survey. This is many years before Rape My Teacher or whatever it is. We did a survey yes. where we decided to just pass out these pieces of paper at assembly without warning anybody, having people rate their teachers because we believed in transparency. And these surveys were immediately rounded up and we got in more trouble. It was a, it was a fraught time. And I think I was... Uh, uh asked by you to become the advisor of the magazine as a, or of the, of the horizon as a young, unknowing teacher. <laughs> I think that's, that's correct. I think I picked you as a victim for a few reasons. One, whoever was the advisor before, perhaps, I don't know, they resigned or they, they stepped down. I don't, I don't remember what happened to whoever your predecessor was. I also don't remember how much I disclosed to you these problems, but you were... <laughs> You were like a big 
you know, as a historian, like your philosophy was let's hear the voices uh, of the voiceless. You've been a scholar of these musicians singing for voiceless people. So I thought, you know, maybe this guy, uh, maybe we can pull the wool over his, his eyes to kind of be a, an adult champion for our free speech cause. Little did I know that you were, you know, going to become the, the ultimate man one day by becoming the head of the school. <laughs> Well, I hope I've maintained some of those. Brian, you have become uh, you have become the establishment. I mean, you have become <laughs> you have become everything you used to you used to poke at through your through your scholarship. You know, uh, right? Yeah. Um, well, uh, there are uh, the the perspectives sometimes change, but um, I hope that we're still listening uh, uh, to those voices uh, as we move forward. And it's great to have your voice with us here today. Tell me a little bit um, about how you arrived at Sidwell Friends. So you came in ninth grade, right? I did. Um, I, uh, I, you know, my my, I, we moved around quite a bit when I was a child. So I was born in um, Cleveland, Ohio. Lived there till I was seven. Then we moved to France for uh, three years. Then we moved back to Cleveland for a year when I was um, ten. Then we moved to D the D.C. area when I was. 11. And a lot of these moves were done in like the middle of the school year or in, you know, April, like they were, you know, it was kind of dictated by my father's work in many cases. And so they were not necessarily the most convenient times for school. Um, and so when we arrived in, in DC, it was, I, I guess I was going into, um, sixth or seventh grade and, uh, we applied to a, variety of schools. I think maybe even Sidwell, I don't remember, you know, we tried to, we tried to sw switch to Sidwell. I applied and fortunately got it in ninth grade. And I'm not just saying this because um, you were nice enough to invite me on the podcast. I will say that of the many, many years of education that I've had before, during and after Sidwell, many schools, college, an abortive graduate school attempt at Harvard. Um, the four years at Sidwell were by far the most important for my education. And I think um, probably I feel that if I uh, hadn't been able to do anything after that, I'd probably be in the same spot I am now. I, I think mm -hmm. af after what I got at Sidwell, I could just have done independent reading and, you know, not to discount anybody else's efforts along the way, but I think there was a foundation of learning and of becoming a lifelong learner and of engaging with certain ideas and, and, and cultivating a certain curiosity, um, that was just unlike, you know, unlike anything else I've ever experienced. You were, uh, certainly always a curious person and always a deeply engaged person. And that's all been borne out by your work after Sidwell, it was off to Michigan, right? Yep. And, and uh, I, you, you know, were, you worked I, on the paper, uh, right? The paper was there. You were working on it also their paper. I did. And by the way, I should say, because, you know, I don't know, I don't know if your own students said, well, students listen to this podcast. Maybe if you make a TikTok version, they will. But, you know, <laughs> I, I loved the University of Michigan, but it was also not my original idea of where I wanted to go. And I was in this very, you know, East Coast pressure cooker, private school environment where I applied to all these Ivy Leagues and, you know, this and that. And I, I got rejected from eight out of the nine colleges I applied to, um, in large part, I think, because I was spending literally all my time on the school newspaper and, you know, not enough time making sure my grades were good. Um, and I often tell people that story to our, in high school because, you know, I, I just think it's important to remember that this pressure cooker environment, whatever, whatever way you get out of the pressure cooker is going to end up working for you in your life. And somehow along the way, there was a stop at McKinsey. There was a terrible, terrible stop. You know, so, so I go to Michigan, <laughs> I work on the school newspaper. Um, and I also, you know, I knew I wanted to be a journalist, as I said. So it was the, it was the paper at, at, at school. But I also did this internship with the New York Times in my senior year at Sidwell. So it was like a senior projects that we have. And I did this one month internship in with fact, the New York Times. Uh, which you had an article published, right? As a result of that in the times. 
Yeah, two 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 articles, and and they were both very quaint. I mean, this is June of 1999. Both very quaint by today's standards. One of them was about how the Federal Election Commission. We we broke the story in the New York Times that the Federal Election Commission was planning to allow internet based donations to politics because they felt that the internet may be becoming an important frontier. Uh, for political activity and donations. So you heard it first in the New York Times. Um, and second, I did a story about this strange group of campaign donors uh, who max out, which in those days was giving $1,000 to each of the Republican and the Democratic nominees in every cycle. And we did a piece of like, who are these people who hedge their bets by donating one grand to both sides? And how, how quaint is it now to talk about rich people who give yeah. one grand to two different candidates. Um, but I wrote those stories and, and reported them and, and wrote them and published them. And, you know, that was addictive. And so all through Michigan, the summers, I did internships in journalism, worked as a, worked as a reporter for the Michigan Daily, um, found different ways to do stuff for the New York Times in some of those summers, worked for the New Republic, um, and was just really, you know, it's funny, these days there's so much messaging in the culture to, you know, spend your 20s, even your 30s, like trying a lot of things and figuring out what you want. And I, I'm happy if that works for people. I think I'm someone who was very lucky to just get started on exactly what I wanted to do when I was 16 years old. And so I just pursued that. So McKinsey happened because I realized I wanted to be a journalist. I decided I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. Um, and without really understanding that no one was going to give me a job as a foreign correspondent, I started applying for all these things. And I went to my New York Times contacts and, you know, they all at various degrees of politeness laughed at me about wanting to be a foreign correspondent in India for the New York Times or whatever. And I got this great advice from Jill Abramson, who was my you know mentor who had given me that first internship. And she said, don't spend your 20s hanging out around the building trying to get in, trying to get this internship or that internship or this freelance piece of that. Like, go out into the world, collide with the world, go to places people don't know about back home, go discover things people don't know. Like, go, go get something in your head and in your experience that people don't know about and want to know about. That's how you make yourself a journalist. And so I had this idea of going to India. I had this idea of you know, colliding with the world, but I couldn't get a journalism job. So as a European history major, history of political thought kind of specialist, um, I decided, you know, I'm going to just get whatever job will take me there. And the most, you know, irrelevant, uh, strange fitting, but will hire anybody from any intellectual background job I could get was McKinsey. So I went on this local contract. Now, people sometimes, because of my writing, are like, oh, man, he really cashed it in with McKinsey. I made $14,000 a year working for McKinsey in Mumbai, living in a rat infested room in like someone else's apartment because I could not afford <laughs> like salaries are really low in India, but rents are the same as New York. It's like not a very workable situation. People live with their parents until they're in their 20s or 30s. Um, I didn't have any you know, family there to live with. So I, I was living in this like rat infested room in someone's house making not that much money. And, um, you know, but it was a way to get to India. And as soon as I got there, I was asked to advise a pharmaceutical company about leadership development, obviously something I did not know about since my thesis was about emerging consciousness of time in early modern Europe. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about how to do leadership development for a pharma company. And I asked somebody like, so where would we look up? Like, who should I work with on this? So like, uh, like, how should I develop the system for leadership development in this company? And they're like, no, you, it's just whatever you, you know, it's like, here's some websites, just like, you know, whatever you want to come up with. And so here I was 21 year old, you know, early modern Europe specialist, uh, brought in, in a pharmaceutical company in India, designing the four leadership criteria of leaders at this company that I just arrived in. And what constituted a one, a two, or three, or a four score on each of these four leadership attributes. And then I sat there a few weeks later as the CEO of this company, evaluated all the men, and it was all men, 
leaders of this company on these four traits, giving them all a score between one and four. And I sat there being like, but these poor guys, like I just made this up. Like I have no idea if those are actually good traits of leaders. Like I have no idea if that's actually a two or a three. I literally made this up because someone forced me to. And now it's like, this is in the world and, and it's so crazy. And so it was this really big wake up call for me of what I came to feel was a very fraudulent, often fraudulent endeavor of these consulting firms that blaze into these, you know, worlds, institutions, companies, organizations they don't know much about and construct an authority that comes out of well-spokenness and analytical firepower, but is based on no understanding of the ground conditions mm. and, and just kind of performing this intellectual swagger so that people do what you say. And I, it, 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 I, you know, even though I had gone there without illusions, I was going there just to be able to get to India and try to get a journalism job. I couldn't even, I could just barely do it. In fact, I didn't really do any client work after the first couple months. I just asked to be taken off that stuff and to do research projects. So I did research projects, mm -hmm. writing projects for another year. And after, you know, just over a year, uh, very luckily got a journalism job um, at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. and, and you followed and Joe's advice of colliding with the world. Yeah. And it was very interesting, you know, because I, India is a tough and complicated place to live. It's stressful. It's, you know, it's demanding. It's, um, it's, it's a society where a lot of the institutions that we take for granted working in the United States don't work, don't really work for people. And, and so when I was there working in this job, I hated my experience of India was just like this stressful, difficult place to live for someone of my background. And once I got, became a journalist, suddenly all the difficulties of India were material and they were gold. Like sudden, and it's so interesting how if you do the work that you're supposed to do, the problems of the world shift, right? Suddenly the fact that this system didn't work in India or that it takes two hours to get to the airport when it's like a few mile drive or whatever, suddenly it became fodder for thinking about why is it that way? What are the systems underneath it? How does power work? You know, and, and so becoming a journalist as a full-time real journalist in India um, just was this blissful opportunity to interrogate this place. And, you know, and it had special resonance for me because my family had grown up in Bombay, the city I'd gone to live in. Uh, my parents had, they had emigrated to the U S I had never lived in India and now I'd visited, but not lived. And now here I was in India, um, kind of investigating the country that I knew only through their stories, only through their narratives, their dinner table anecdotes, all of which are in a way, the way all of our narratives are, some mix of reality and one's own interpretation of events and one's own self-justifying stories and all of those things. And so now here I was looking at the country, you know, unfiltered with my own eyes, a country that had changed drastically um, since the time they left and trying to figure out, you know, what happened to their India to, to become the, the India that I had found. Mm. And how, how did that experience in India uh, shape your work and, and to some extent, I suppose, reshape your consciousness? Um, I would say in two ways in particular. One, India, it's easy. I mean, a lot of people who go to India, you know, feel it's an outlier and, and it is an outlier in a whole bunch of ways. I mean, the, the, just the levels of poverty you will see yeah, exceed anything that you might have experienced um, in a country like the United States, the breadth of it, the depth of it, um, the, you know, subjugation of women on a scale like that, right? I mean, we have problems in this country with the way we treat women, but you see that and you think I mean, it's a different level. Everything feels like it's on a different level. But as I became a reporter in India, started telling these stories, what became really clear is that India merely exaggerates a lot of the conditions and realities and truths about the world that are true everywhere. And one of the things I did while I was a journalist there was I would marry my own reporting 
aka like first hand first draft of history talking to people going to a farm or talk to farmers go like picking up what you could from people i would pair that with a certain amount of reading about india and a certain amount of reading like on my weekends or evenings about other countries journeys to modernity and you realize that these they're these deep Patterns. I mean, you know this from history, this whole mm -hmm. thing about modernization theory and is there a single mm -hmm. journey or are there different journeys? But but it was interesting to kind of understand how how these these deep forces were working through it. And so, you know, it when I came back to America many years later, I think the experience of India helped me understand how something like caste um, mm -hmm. is not only something that exists in India. But exists in America, and of course, there's now a brilliant Isabel Wilkerson book by that title right. making that very case. Yep. It it helped me understand that when we talk in America about you know being a meritocracy or people ending up where they are because of their effort, it's not true in America. But but it helped me going to India to see how profoundly untrue it is, and then I came home and realized, you know what, it's actually kind of not true here, also, right. It, it, India mm -hmm. is in many ways a naked display of how power works, um, but also of how democracy works, of the you know potentially positive and negative aspects of markets and capitalism, um, and so on and so forth. So it was a very dramatic education in all the kind of fundamental things you end up writing about as journalists. And the second, the second big way it affected me in terms of more form is is very specific to the the beat I had. You know, I was not in New Delhi, where New Delhi, if you're if you're in New Delhi, you're like the important foreign correspondent, which was not me. Right? If you're if you're in New Delhi, if you're in the capital, if you're in Beijing, like you're gonna whatever stories happen in that country, that region, you have to do something, right? You have if there's a bomb that goes off, you gotta do it. If there, the government passes some sweeping new reform, you gotta do a story. If there's a war, even in the neighboring country, you got to do a story. So that's a job with a lot of responsibility. It's also why I didn't get such a job. Um, but it's also a job, you know, with prestige and a job where a lot of your days are filled and dictated by events, by news, right? Um, because I was in Bombay, I didn't have that responsibility, except when there was like a big business story, the stock market dropped 10% or something a couple times a year, I'd have to do something or a terrorist attack. Aside from that, my job was entirely like elective stories. So my job, as I kind of defined it for myself, was to step back and say, this country, India, is going through massive economic, social, political changes. And what are, the, what are the big stories to tell? What are the longitudinal stories to tell? Not something that happened yesterday, right? And so I ended up becoming this kind of chronicler of these big social psychological changes in India. I would say almost psychological mm -hmm. as much as anything else. For example, mm -hmm. um, you know, what happens? My, my book agent a long time ago summarized this so well. He was, you know, like he called it the Romeo and Juliet revolution. Like what is Romeo and Juliet about? It's when two people start to experiment with the notion that maybe you should marry for love, not family pragmatism. Like that's fundamentally what that's about, right? There's an, an, an existing tradition in the West, in, you know, in Italy in that time that you marry to advance the economic and productive statuses of two families. And these two people have a different idea. What if you just married for love? Now, not a radical idea in the West, but a very radical idea at its time. Well, in the time I was in India, India was living through the Romeo and Juliet revolution at that period, still is, right? So I got to tell stories like, what happens when you have the dawn of an idea that a 25 year old woman should marry to fulfill the longings of her heart, not secure her family's fortunes. What happens? Who does that implicate? Who does that cost? Who loses? Who wins? How does that change dawn on her? You know, wait, I, I got to write stories about cell phones. I mean, cell phones are such a dramatic force in India because in India, often people 
would not have um, a laptop or a computer. They'd go straight to a cell phone and as their first kind of major piece of technology. And often these same people, young people, would never have had their own bedroom. Right? They're living in these crowded apartments or in a village or in a small town, two or three kids to a bedroom, maybe living even with their parents all in the same bedroom. And then they get this phone. And one young guy I interviewed was like, the, in India, the cell phone's a bedroom. It's the first bedroom I've ever had. It's the mm. first place I can go Interesting. where yeah. I can have private thoughts, share them with other people, be my own person without being seen by those I love. Um, and I started then researching the history of the automobile in the United States in the 1950s and the way in which that was a technology of individuation from family. You know, so mm -hmm. I, it really set me on the path to what I do now, which I summarize in this title of this course I teach at NYU, which is Ideas Through People, telling the story of the biggest intellectual forces of our age, but told through how people, how they show up in the stories and lives of people. We just lost John Lewis over the summer, who was a great troubadour, of course, for civil rights. And his power to forgive reminds me of the true American. Tell us a little bit about that, how you came to that story and uh, about the very important lessons you conveyed through that book. You know, it was really interesting. Um, I, so I came, I moved back to the United States from India in 2009 and was still finishing up India Calling. I'd done all the reporting, was just finishing up the writing and editing for another year or so, but immediately began, you know, thinking about what my next book was. And, and I knew I wanted to write something about America and I knew I wanted to write something about what I felt to be um, this very peculiar nature of the divide we were experiencing. I mean, there was a lot of talk already about inequality and, you know, Occupy Wall Street was two years after I arrived back. Um, but in the, my, the travels and observations that I was making, I felt there was something deeper, a, a kind of what I now call a cold civil war, um, where it was not just inequality, it was not just an economic gap, it was a coming apart of the country. It was an upward secession of elites out of public life and a kind of downward secession of um, many people living down and out lives where they're put upon by the systems and structures in place. And so I just was thinking about how do you tell a story of a country falling apart in this way, coming apart, um, to, to quote a book that came out during that period. And what I need, you know, I didn't, what I couldn't find was the particular story I wanted to tell, right? I didn't want to write some general book about that. And then one day I am sitting in bed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, reading the New York Times on my iPad to actually try to get column ideas. It was a Thursday and I had a column in the New York Times every other Friday. I needed to write my column that day. So I would you know, and on those days, I would often scrape the bottom of the barrel of reading. So I'd go through the full New York Times on the app. I would get to the news briefs. I would read those, just anything to get an idea. And I wasn't getting ideas. So I kept reading. I kept reading. And I finally ended up in national briefings, which is like the, the absolute dregs of the New York Times report when you've really read the entire New York Times. And in the national briefing, I saw this story of a guy, you know, having been executed in Texas the night before. So far, so Texas. Uh, and then the you know, next part of it was in his final days, one of his Muslim immigrant victims has been fighting to save his life in the name of forgiveness. And that was not something I'd heard before. And so I started digging into it. By 11 a.m. that day, two hours later, I had called out to my wife, like, this is my next big project. Because it is this story of a white supremacist who we would now say was Trumpism before Trump. I mean, it's the exact ideology of Donald Trump, the exact set of grievances, the exact inversion of personal hurt into this hatred of others, um, this exact sense of 
you know, um, white men being left behind and being stiffed. Um, this guy goes on a hate crime spree after 9-11, goes to three gas stations and pulls the trigger on three gas station clerks, all immigrants, brown immigrants from South Asia. Two of them die. Third one, Reis Buyan, survives. Bangladeshi immigrant, former Air Force officer in his country, was going to have a great cushy life in his country, be chauffeured around in a government car his whole life if he'd stayed, probably become a UN peacekeeper, which a lot of Bangladeshi military folks do. But no, like a lot of people who have come to America over the generations, he actually had a perfectly fine life that was simply not fine for him. He wanted more. His siblings maybe we're fine with, with their lives. He wanted more. He came to America. He's going to get into IT. He's going to get into all these things. But first, he understands, you know, if you want to rise, you have to first fall sometimes in America. So he's working in a gas station, saving up money for a wedding, saving up money for school, gets shot in the face by this white supremacist right after 9-11. And unlike the other two who died, race survives. He loses one eye, but he survives. And the story goes that you know, years later, as he rebuilds his life, he becomes whole again. He ends up making six figures in IT. He miraculously, after a lot of struggle, being homeless, having medical debt, living all the American traumas, in addition to the basic one of being shot in the face because you're not white, he makes it in America. The America that he had come for eventually did still work for him. And he started to feel this immense gratitude for that and started to wonder what he could do to pay America back. And he has this realization that he wants in the name of Islam and in the name of promoting forgiveness between the Muslim world and the West, he wants to forgive the guy who shot him in the face. He wants to learn about him. He wants to forgive him. And he wants to fight the state of Texas and the then governor, Rick Perry, to prevent them from executing this guy. And in a, in a marvelous uh, kind of coup of trolling, um, he sued the state of Texas, citing Sharia law, arguing that Sharia law compels Mus uh, mercy from Muslims, requires Muslims to extend mercy. And therefore, as a newly minted American citizen under the First Amendment, he had the right to extend mercy uh, as prescribed to him by Sharia law. And uh, as soon as I heard of this story, I just thought it was the most remarkable thing that was about two men and two Americas and, and hatred and forgiveness, but also about every other thing that has, has become in a way even more prominent in the years since, about inequality, about the breakdown of social structures, about you know, white working class downward mobility, about um, the coming majority minority America, about, uh, you know, meritocracy and the opportunity ladder, about healthcare. I mean, race was kicked out of the hospital a couple days after being admitted, you know, being shot in the face with one eye not working. He was discharged with his eye still not working, you know, because essentially being shot in the face was a pre existing condition and he didn't have insurance. So they kicked him out. That's America. So it was a story where everything about us, it seemed to me, was in this story. And I spent the next few years of my life, you know, reporting the hell out of the story, spending time in Texas <laughs> and, and writing the book that, that became The True American. The TED Talk is especially powerful. And in the, that performance, you refer to America as a republic of dreams and a republic of fears. I was struck by that description. Do you think it still holds? How have you seen that play out over um, the years since writing that book? I think it it does still hold up to me, and I, and and this is where you know paying attention as I do to the big roiling argument we're having right now, the argument over the election, but really argument about two visions of America. Um, I often find myself. In a, in a slightly different position than a lot of the folks I agree with about a lot of things, because I believe very strongly in two theses that are in tension with each other, to say the least. And, and, and one of those is that this is a country, you know, not that did some bad things along the way. This is a country conceived in violence, conceived in sin, with blood 
at the root. It is a country built on native genocide and built on slavery. It is, it is in some profound way rotten to the core. And I, there I is a space. Yeah, I just, I, I, it, we're having that gap delay, but I, I was saying that uh, I woke up this morning and uh, read my New York Times briefing, and there you are speaking about this exact thing, right? Um, yes. Responding to, responding to the Gilbert Cruz uh, assertion that uh, Biden is vulnerable on law and order issues. And uh, if I could, I'd just read what was um, excerpted from your response. America does have a law and order problem, but it's nothing new. And the nature of that law and order problem is being the most violent country in the rich world. And the genesis of that violence isn't black and brown communities rising up against friendly, overwhelmingly white suburbs of Minneapolis. It's white America from the founding days of the republic committing to an economic and political model that made violence a daily systemic necessity. Yeah, and it's, you know, I, I think that statement, which which I was making on top of a, an interview I did in my newsletter with Senator Chris Murphy, who has written a book in which he you know, makes very similar arguments. I don't think a Democratic or Republican senator would have made such an argument five years ago. You know, I don't think that would have been on the cards. But what has happened, thankfully, in recent years is this really powerful growing reckoning where I think the, the first thesis that I'm laying out, the blood at the root thesis is not right. as controversial as it once was. And you, and you're seeing its power in the fact that yesterday, just yesterday, the president of the United States gave a speech critiquing the 1619 project and critical race theory, which is the ultimate endorsement of the importance of those ideas. And I'm sure at Sidwell, as at, the schools my kids go to as that in, in the newspapers that we read, there is a real reckoning right now of coming to understand that we are a blood at the root country, um, to quote Billy Holiday, and that and that we still have to love ourselves and 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 like believe in our like it, it, saying that doesn't mean it's game over and you go home, but we are a blood at the root country. Um the second thesis I would make, and a lot of the folks who maybe make the blood at the root thesis don't say the second thing as often, maybe I don't say the second thing as often, is I think we are a profoundly special country with some ideals and some practices that are unique in the history of the world. Um, practices mm -hmm. we very often have failed up to live up to, but practices and ideas that are actually different. And you know, I've had the experience uh, when I was very young, when I, we moved to France, as I was telling you, and my parents were, 10 years ahead in their lives, you know, they were, had more money than they did when they were just starting out. They were further, my father was further in his career. Um, we moved to France because they actually kind of got bored of the immigration thing. They'd, they'd figured it out in America. They now wanted to do, be immigrants again. And so they moved to France and it was very clear from day one that you will never become French. You will never mm -hmm. become French. <laughs> that's not, that's not what happens here. And that was the message they got for three years. We could be there. We could have a great time. The River Seine truly is beautiful in the summertime, but you would never become French. And for all the flaws of this country and for all the moments when I've encountered racism or they've encountered racism in this country, there is an idea in this country that anybody can become an American and, and an American can be any kind of person that actually is meaningfully different in the history of nations. And we are doing an amazing job slowly, fitfully of building a country on that principle. And there's a lot of people who are terrified by that, trying to mess it up. But that doesn't, like, we are falling on our face right now as a nation because we are jumping higher, trying something harder than any country's ever attempted in the history of the world. And I think I am trying to, in my writing and my thinking, hold space for the notion that this is as special an endeavor as any country's ever set out to do. And we are a profoundly existentially from the root, flawed, broken country. Um, and I think there's space for both of those truths. One of, I'm struck by your biography on your website and that first sentence. 
Anna Girdadardas is a writer. What what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think for me, a writer is someone who has this really incredible privilege and opportunity and platform and burden to tell people the truth about their common life. Um, now, there may be writers who write about science or write about, you know, ancient history, but I, I'm talking about the kind of writing I do where you're broadly writing about us now, how we live, whether it's straightforward journalism or something a little different. I think that kind of writer, um, the charge is to is to tell the truth. And, and the reason that matters is because a lot of people, most people, almost all people are paid to not be able to tell the truth, right? Most people have real jobs. And when you have a real job, you can't say what you think about whatever, right? I'm sure you have thoughts about a variety of other schools or maybe even, you know, your own school. Uh, you can't necessarily say all of them and certainly not publicly. Um, people who work on Wall Street, I will tell you from my reporting experience, actually have a whole mix of feelings about finance. They can't talk about it. Um, people who work, you know, in politics, uh, they, they leak a lot because they can't actually say what they think in public. And so our society tasks this small group of people with the job of saying the things other people are not allowed to say or NDA'd from saying or too tired and busy to say or haven't gotten the training to express in a way that other people can take it in or be entertained by it. Um, and someone like me is absorbing through formal interviews and observation, but also just ambiently, osmotically absorbing a lot of the things that people say in a society that they can't say formally or publicly and, and, and kind of congealing it into some kind of larger understanding. So the idea that, for example, in my most recent book, that some of the richest, most powerful people in the world are doing all these big, elaborate, do-gooding gestures of philanthropy, et cetera, but are in fact fundamentally interested, even through their philanthropy, in keeping the world the same, keeping the system the same, protecting the status quo above all. That is not something I was the first to say. That's been said by, you know, St. Saint Augustine. You know, he was one of many people to say that, but I was in a particular environment in, the, in this time and place, the mid-2010s, um, in which I heard that and noticed that in a particular way and then, you know, could go and report that out, which is to say go and find characters who could talk about it, do interviews, do observation. That simple sentence uh, that I'm a writer is is very important to me. It's it's what I've done full time for for 15 years now. Um, and it it's something that I feel very, very, very lucky to do is to fundamentally be a witness to um, to our common life together. In one of your interviews, I heard you say that you feel that America is ready for an age of reform. You see some real hope in this possibility? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's there's this question I love from the writer Valerie Kaur, who asks, you know, in this moment of darkness that we're in, is this the darkness of the tomb or the darkness of the womb? Um, and and I think her own answer to that is that it's both. Something is dying right now, and something is being born. And it's always obvious when something's dying what the thing that's dying is. But when something's being born, you're not sure what you're going to get. And this moment with you know these five synchronous crises which came to a head this revolutionary summer in many ways with Corona, um, the economic crisis that grew out of Corona, the racial uprising that happened this summer, um, the democratic crisis embodied by Donald Trump, um, whose, whose awfulness was ex displayed um, so acutely in recent months, and then this crisis of the climate that's hovering over all of this. Um, that these crises, they're dark, they're, they're a recipe for despair, but they also raise this question of whether we're at the end of an era, whether, you know, what we are really seeing through the way the virus hit us, through the way climate is hitting us, that we have not been living right. Um, 
in some ways, if I have to think about the connective tissue in all these different crises, these five crises, they all are in different ways telling us you have not been living right. Everything. You haven't been voting right. You haven't been eating right. You haven't been living in harmony with the planet right. You haven't taken care of your health correctly. You haven't lived with the right level of concern for each other. You haven't lived right in terms of checking greed and other base emotions. And so what I wonder is whether this, in many ways, rock bottom moment for the country, and I hope it's rock bottom, it feels pretty low, is, is a moment that precedes a bounce back, an awakening, and yes, an age of reform, which I would define as an age in which public purpose um, once again overtakes private purpose as the as the kind of defining striving of the age in which, you know, what we do together matters more than what we do alone. Um, the common institutions we build, the laws we pass, the ways in which we serve communities come to matter more than what we take. Um, and if there is a silver lining or a way to find some kind of hope in this time, it's that a brokenness this complete um, in some ways has to give way um, to, to a dawn. That was terrific. Anand, it's so great to connect with you and it's been just a joy to watch your career unfold. Thank you for spending time with us today. And I hope that we can get together and talk offline sometime soon. I would love that. And as I always tell you, I, I mean it when I say you're one of like two or three teachers in my life who are the reason I became a writer as opposed to like something terrible. You're too kind, thank you. 